sermon today is taken from the, uh, the book of Mark. Mark, uh, the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 31. Uh, someone commented on the title today of the sermon. Which God slash God do you serve? But you'll notice that there's God up there twice. One with a capital G and one with a small g. And we know that there's only one God who has the capital G in his name. There are many gods who have the small g as a part of their title. Let's start by reading um, Mark 10, starting in verse 17, and reading down to verse 31. And Jesus, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why? Do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Uh, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not uh, give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, the man declared, all these things have I kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and, and loved him. One thing you lack, Jesus said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have your treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. Man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his word. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for anyone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with, uh, not with God. All things are possible. With God. Verse 28, then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the, the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Fathers, what such an interesting uh, text this is today. Father, we have an opportunity to learn more about you, more about your character, and more about what you expect from us. We ask your presence here. We ask the direction of the Holy Spirit that our hearts can be touched and really understand and comprehend so we might apply to our lives these words. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, as I, I start out reading in verse uh, 17 here, uh, let's read that and then expound on verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a, young, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees uh, before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I'm sure that's on the minds of many people. They want to know. But there are many people that don't have the answer to that question. So that they know for sure that they will have eternal life. Now, as Jesus was leaving, 
and heading for his next destination. Uh, he was heading toward Judea, and this was on the last leg of his journey before going into Jerusalem to be crucified. A rich young man, some say he was one of the religious leaders in the church, ran up to Jesus and fell on his knees as in a, a worshipful form to ask him a question. Being a religious man, he wanted to be sure he would get eternal life. So he asked Jesus the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Straightforward. I want to know. Steeped in the legalism of his day, the young man naturally thought in terms of some religious deeds that would guarantee him eternal life. He was probably thinking of some Jewish works of righteousness. He wanted to do something to merit eternal life. He had no concept that Jesus taught that eternal life is a gift, not something merited by good works, not something earned by good works. And then Jesus uh, said in verse 18, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Here, Jesus is not denying the fact that he is very good. And he really didn't know if the young man comprehended that he was God. He knew, the man knew that Jesus was, was good, quote unquote good. And he didn't know and comprehend that Jesus was really God himself. And then he said to him in verse 19, verse 19, Jesus' answer to him, You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, or as the original commandment was, you shall not covet. Covet and defraud are maybe close. You defraud, you take from people. You're coveting what they had, so you defraud them. He says, also honor your father and your mother. The man asked the question on the basis of works. What must I do? to inherit eternal life. So Jesus answered him on that basis. Now you know that the Ten Commandments are divided into ten, two sections. The first section, the first four commandments refer to loving God. The last six of the ten refer to your fellow man. Love your fellow man. Jesus cited here the last six. Love your fellow man. Love your neighbor. Would you turn with me to Romans, the 13th chapter? Romans 13, verses 8 through 12. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For uh, whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commands there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm, does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So loving your fellow man is 
fulfilling the law. So the young man uh, said in verse 20, he said, Teacher, all these have I kept since I was a boy. Now on the surface, does that seem possible? That he kept all of those commandments perfectly from his youth up? If he did, he was some kid. He was not the ordinary kid. <laughs> from a youth up, he kept all of those commandments. But that's what he said. Well, this young man, or ruler, was totally sincere. He, he was Jewish. And the Jews had a tradition for boys that at age 13, they celebrated what? Bar Mitzvah. He's of age. Son of commandment. He's age 13. That was their tradition. And now he could assume full responsibility of all of his actions. So obviously at age 13, he went through this. He went through this, this tradition that they had. Again, the, the young religious leader was totally sincere and had made the and had made the law the norm of his life. And no doubt was confident that he had personally fulfilled all of his demands. But, however, he was a little anxious about his true relationship with God. And the absence of, and the absence of peace of mind drove him to ask Jesus the question, what more do I need to do to inherit eternal life? In his mind, he was blameless or faultless. Just like the Apostle Paul before the Lord God uh, got his attention on the road to Damascus. Paul said in Philippians 3, 6, As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless, or he was blameless. King James. That's what Paul felt. But not in terms of internal attitude and motives based on God's truth. Now, he felt he was blameless as this young man felt that he was blameless. But not in terms of internal attitude and motives based on the truth of God. Jesus looked at the young man and loved him. You know, that, to me that's powerful. Jesus didn't judge him. Uh, Jesus just met him where he was. The man thought that he was, was holy, was righteous. Jesus met him there. Jesus loved him. There was no judgment here. There was no one-upmanship here. There was no critiquing him down. Yeah. Jesus looked at the man, loved him, and just stuck with the facts. One thing you lack, Jesus said. Jesus is being sincere with this sincere young man. You want eternal life? You said you had kept the law since you were a boy. You want to know what more you need to do to inherit eternal life. Go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in he heaven. Then come and follow me. One thing you lack. What about you and me, brother? 
What do we lack to inherit eternal life? What do we lack in our lives? We're sincere, but sometimes we could be missing something. What do we lack to inherit eternal life? John MacArthur, in his commentary, says this about eternal life. It is more than just eternal existence. It is a different quality of life. It is in Christ alone. Those who possess it have died to sin and are alive in God. They have the very life of Christ in them. They enjoy a relationship with Jesus Christ that will never end. And the young rich ruler wanted this. That's what he wanted. But there is one thing that you lack. Go sell everything that you possess and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, although Jesus asked this man to sell everything and give the money to the poor, this does not mean that all believers should sell their possessions. Most of Jesus' followers did not sell everything, although they did use their possessions to serve others. Jesus was talking to this rich ruler. This, his possessions were his idol. So Jesus addressed him. I asked the question before, what do you lack to inherit eternal life? This story shows us that we should not let anything we have or desire keep us from following Jesus. Uh, this man had done well in his performance of the letter of the law. But there was failure in keeping the spirit of the law. On the one hand, his many possessions had become his God. And he needed to sell them so that he could worship the true God wholeheartedly. On the other hand, he thought he was keeping, on the other hand, he was keeping the letter of the law but he needed to give to the poor, thus fulfilling the second part of the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Here, Jesus was exposing the young man's heart. He was exposing the young man's heart. His security was in his wealth. He was not blameless as he thought he was in verse 20. He loved his possessions more than he loved his neighbors. His security was in his wealth. One more point here in verse 21. It says, then come and follow me. You know, that sounds a little bit like... Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciples must decide, deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Take up his cross. Take up his cross. A life of sacrifice. 
perhaps persecution, perhaps giving, going without, all to reap the reward of being with Jesus in the end. Sacrifice, take up your cross, follow me. Verse 22, at this day, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? This man was truly disappointed. The price that he had to pay to inherit eternal life was too high. He loved his wealth. He couldn't fathom giving it all up. Wow. Now that's a God. Jeff Broadmax brought that out in speaking of life. That's your God. Let nothing stand in the way of you receiving eternal life. Amen. Nothing. Jesus said that it was very difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. However, he did not say that it was impossible. He said it was very difficult. This is true because the rich, with most of their basic needs met, often are self-reliant. When they feel empty, they can just buy whatever new thing to dull the pain that was meant, perhaps, to drive them toward God. However, the person who has everything on earth that they need or want can still lack the most important thing, eternal life. Look at your athletes, the boxers. I mentioned this last week. <laughs> I saw uh, on the internet uh, Muhammad Ali and uh, George Foreman. Uh, George Foreman was retiring. And Muhammad Ali, I think this was a time, was coming on. And their purse was both of them five million dollars to be in the ring for a total of what, an hour? You know, they could have, either one of them could, could have gotten killed. That's, that's very true. But the athletes, the quarterbacks, and other professional football players, $20, $30 million a season. Some of them is guaranteed. Wow. Those people, they can get whatever they want, whatever they wanted, at whatever cost it might cost. You know, now, when that happens, to some of them, why do they need God? There are many of them, though, you follow their blogs, or you follow them, they, they are Christians. They put God first. They give God a cut of that money. But you know, a, a cut of $20 million is, is quite a bit. <laughs> you can buy half of, well, you can't buy half of the city, but you can buy it off the land. But the wealthy, whenever there's a hurt, a basic need, often they are, they are self-reliant. When they feel empty, they can just buy whatever new to dull the pain. The person who has everything on earth they need or want can still, though, lack the most important thing, eternal life. It's the most important thing in life. Now, now that this young ruler had left, he had gone away sad, face, you know, present, 
fallen. Jesus was able to teach the disciples a very valuable lesson. Wealth does not automatically exclude one from God's kingdom, but it is almost an insurmountable obstacle. Verse 24, the disciples were amazed at his words. How could this be? The very of uh, the view of that day was that prosperity and wealth were virtues and signs of God's blessing. And that poverty was an indication of God's disfavor. And you know, brethren, we tend to think that way today. But thorough understanding of Scripture reveals that often it is the wicked who become rich. Uh, Psalms 73, verse 12. And the poor who are favored by God. Psalms 34, 6. Let's look at those. Psalms 73, verse 12. Psalm 73, verse 12, it says, This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Psalms 34, verse 6. Psalms 34, verse 6. The poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. What a dichotomy. What a dichotomy. We always mix it up. Now, I, I want to make a statement here that I want you to get. Our outward physical position in life has nothing to do with true spirituality. Did you get that? Yeah. Our outward physical position in life has nothing to do with true spirituality, neither poverty or wealth is a prerequisite to entering the kingdom of God. But for the disciples, it was hard for them to fathom that to enter the kingdom of God, one must become like a little child. Remember Matthew uh, 19, 14. Suffer little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God. Remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man? Who entered the kingdom of God into Abraham's bosom? The rich man or Lazarus? The poor man. Wealth does not disqualify one from a position in the kingdom, but trusting in the wealth does. Jesus said in verse 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, you know, there has been all kinds of speculation as to what Jesus meant by that statement. But most commentaries say that you should Take the statement at face value. At the time in Palestine, the camel was the largest known animal in the land. And the eye of the needle was the smallest opening that they knew of. So what Jesus was saying was that 
without the help of God, it is impossible for the rich man or woman to enter into the kingdom of God. Salvation by human effort alone is impossible. And it can only and completely come, that is salvation, by the power of God's grace. Again, you can't own it. It's His grace. Verse 26. Let's see. Get back here. Verse 26. Then the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Again, the disciples were amazed. Was not wealth a blessing from God and a reward for being good? This misconception is still common today. Although many believers do enjoy material prosperity, many others live in hardship. Just look at our, our brothers and sisters in many other countries. Look at the people in Haiti, what they have gone through. You know, Grace Communion, we learned at our virtual conference, we have members in about 67 countries around the world. And really, America, the United States here, is probably one of the most blessed. All the rest of them, there are people who are suffering, but they are coming to God. Many others live in hardship. Wealth is not a sign of faith or partiality on the part of God. The disciples, bewildered, continue. If this was the case with the rich, what chance do the poor have? Who then could be saved? On the curse, on the poor curse of God, or are creatures of God's disfavor? Again, God reminded them, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Man or woman cannot be saved by his or her own effort. It's through the power of God's Spirit. Okay, verses 28 through 30. Then Peter spoke up. He got to love Peter because he's always got something to say. He's always <laughs> reflecting what the other 11 are thinking. Hey, Peter, can you ask him this? Or Peter, what do you think you meant? But Peter will get up, he'll speak up. You, you, you have to love Peter. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me, and the gospel will fail to receive 100 times as much in this present age, home, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Peter noted to the Lord that the twelve had done all that the Lord has asked the rich man or the rich ruler to do, and they had come to him on his own terms. Jesus, we've come on the terms you wanted us to come on. Would that self-abandoning faith qualify us for a place in your kingdom? 
final scripture. Would you turn with me to the parallel gospel account in Matthew? Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verse 22. And then we'll go down to verse 30. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Peter asked him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left Houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will and will and uh, will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Yes, many who have everything and are first will be last. And those who have little will be first. What a dichotomy in the way people think. We emphasize the fact that wealth is not wrong Wealth is not wrong of itself. Yeah. Which Jesus said, I came that they might have life. Yeah. And that they might have it more abundantly. Yeah. What do you have now? He wants you to have that and even more. Yeah. But it's according to how he blesses you. And we have to be satisfied with our station in life. Yes, many who have everything and are first, they're first in line, they're first in buying the newest things that come out. That's not where the priority is. Those who give up everything, however, for Jesus and the sake of the gospel will receive a hundredfold or one hundred times what they have sacrificed, and they will inherit eternal life. Hallelujah. And praise God. Thank you, Father. You have received you, you have spoken to the, the disciples and given them a promise. That promise applies to us also. That those of us who sacrifice for you, those of us who are not in it for what we can get out of it only, you will bless us a hundred times if for you and for the gospel's sake we sacrifice, and we sacrifice, Father, daily. We sacrifice to have the character of Jesus Christ. We sacrifice to be examples to others. We sacrifice, Father, that we can bring others to you through our prayers, 
and through our examples, that's what you want of us. You don't ask a whole lot for us in a sense, but that we be dedicated to you and living a life that's pleasing to you. Thank you so very much for this lesson. And thank you, Father, for our brothers and sisters around the world who realize that it's not the wealth of this world that's secure for us. It is in the world for the wealthy, but our security comes through Jesus Christ. There's a little suffering right now. There's a little sacrifice right now. But in the end, we will inherit everything 100 fold, 100 times what we have even thought about sacrificing. We give you thanks. We love you. We ask that you would be with us daily. We ask for your encouragement, Father, because many times we're sick or we know people who are sick and we get down and we get uh, frustrated. And Father, we're just not sure about things sometimes, but we realize that our trust must continue to remain in you. We give you thanks and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.